Give thanks, give thanks, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good. The Lord is one, the Lord is great, and He is good. Give thanks, give thanks, give thanks unto the Lord and His love. It will endure forevermore, His love will endure. Give thanks, give thanks, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, His love will endure. Give thanks unto the Lord. Let the redeemed of the Lord give thanks, those He has saved from the hand of the evil one and the power of the grave. He gathers us from all the earth, from east and west and north and south. Let all mankind proclaim His worth, His praise flow from our mouth. Give thanks, give thanks, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, His love will endure. Give thanks unto the Lord. Hello, it's Thanksgiving Sunday today in Canada, and the Bible says that we should enter into His gates with thanksgiving. And we don't have to look around very far to find many reasons to be truly grateful. We praise God for the fact that He is holy and just, kind, loving, good, and willing to save anyone who comes to Him in the name of Jesus. And we're thankful for the measure of health and strength that we have, the food that we have to eat, our families, our friends, and our local churches that teach us about the Bible and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful for this beautiful country we have to live in. And I'm thankful for every single person behind the scenes who helps us so faithfully here at the Sheffield Baptist Church. Every week they pray, they give, they support us and encourage us. And we are so grateful. And I pray that there's people in your life who truly express their thanks to you for who you are and all that you do. If no one has thanked you lately, then perhaps this will mean something to you. It honestly comes from the bottom of my heart. I'm really thankful for you, for who you are, and for who God is has made you and for all that you accomplish and do for him and other people. Honestly, thanks. Let's pray. Oh God, you are the one that we ought to thank for all things. And in everything, we should be thankful because you are behind the scenes. You created this world and everyone in it, and you have sustained us to this very moment. And we should be very thankful for the people you've placed in our lives. We should be very thankful for the circumstances that you have used to shape and mold us into the people we are. And we should be most grateful that 2,000 years ago, you sent your only son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to die on the cross for our sins, to be buried and rise again the third day and he's preparing a place for us right now and for all of these things and more we say thanks in Jesus name amen we are the temple of Christ the fullness of God is at work in us he is our hope Jesus is making us glorious. Thanks be to our God, who always leads us in triumph. Thanks be to our God, who always leads us in triumph. the 
salt and the light, sharing the hope of His glorious grace. Thanks be to our God, who always leads us in Today is Thanksgiving Sunday, and so the sermon is simply entitled Thanksgiving. The main idea is that we all should have a lot of Thanksgiving, not a little. And to be honest, many of us are fairly light when it comes to the area of being thankful. People do and go and give to us all the time, and yet sometimes we don't remember to say thank you, And often we expect more of them. So let's all learn to be just a little more thankful. And for our text, we're going to Colossians chapter 1 today, verse number 12. And Colossians has a lot of thanksgiving in it. In verse number 12, the Apostle Paul is praying for the Colossian believers. And listen to what he says, Colossians 1, 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Now, admittedly, that verse is quite a mouthful. And at the end of today's sermon, I'll give you the interpretation and a few applications for that verse. But before I talk about Paul's thankfulness, I'd like to talk about Paul's Lord and how thankful the Lord Jesus Christ is. He has a very thankful heart. And in order to illustrate it, I'd like to go back to two biblical scenes in the Gospels where first we see our Lord Jesus Christ at the grave of his friend Lazarus. You might remember reading about it in John chapter 11. The shortest verse in the Bible is John 11:35, where our Lord Jesus Christ is said to have wept. Jesus wept, and he was weeping because his dear friend Lazarus had died. And at the grave, Jesus prayed. And I'd like for you to listen to Jesus' prayer, because it's not a time when you would expect somebody to have a lot of thanksgiving. And yet, listen to what the Lord says. It says in John 11, 41, that uh, Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you. Thank you? Now, what would our Lord Jesus or anyone have to be thankful for at such a moment of grief and loss? There are two things listed here that we can easily pick out. First, he said, Father, I thank you. He was thankful for his Father in heaven. He was thankful at a time like that, with such grief in his heart, he was not alone. 
he could look up and know that just above him in heaven is a strong, compassionate, comforting, loving, supportive father who's listening to him and helping him. He says, Father, I'm thankful for you. And the exact same is true for all of us in our moments of grief and every other moment of life. There is a Father just above you in heaven. And listen to what Psalm 34 and verse number 18 says. Psalm 34 and verse number 18. This is what we read. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Now back in John 11, Jesus is also thankful, it says here, that his heavenly Father heard him. There was a faultless, open, direct line of communication between Jesus and his heavenly Father. Listen to how the verse continues. John 11, 41. Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. He says, I'm thankful for my heavenly Father, and I'm thankful for the faultless, open, direct line of communication that exists between him and God. Now that's something to be thankful for, that there's a, a direct line between us and God. You know, I can't get a hold of the Prime Minister of Canada. Uh, I can't even get a hold of some of the departments in the government of Canada. You know, if I tried to dial today, say, Revenue Canada or maybe Employment Insurance, or even if I perhaps tried the municipal government to ask them something about maybe my local garbage pickup, you know what would probably happen. I'd, I'd likely h hear a recording, and then maybe that recording would tell me to press 1 or press 2 or press 3. And maybe even after I pressed 1 or 2 or 3, I might get another recording. And you've probably been on the other end of the phone sometimes when you go through all of those button-pushing exercises, and you get disconnected. And you have to go back through and do it all over again. Never happens with the God of the universe. There is a direct line of communication between him and the believer. He speaks to us through his word. We speak to him through prayer. And I am so thankful that our Father in heaven has this open line to every one of us. And we don't even have to speak. He knows our thoughts. And so at this very moment, while I'm preaching to you, I'm talking to the Heavenly Father, silently asking him to help me and to take these words and make them special to you. Now, going over into uh, Luke chapter 10, we have another biblical scene where the 70 that Jesus had sent out to preach the good news of the kingdom two by two throughout the country had returned rejoicing to him that even the devils were subject to them in his name. And you might remember Jesus said in John chapter 10, I saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven. And then in John 10, or in Luke 10, uh, 17, Jesus prayed, and listen to his prayer. It begins almost the same way as the prayer that we looked at in John 10 at the grave of his friend Lazarus. This is Luke chapter 10, verse 21. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them babes. 
Here is our Lord Jesus Christ beginning his prayer once again with thanks. And what's he thankful for? It begins in the same way as the other prayer. He's thankful for his Father in heaven. And in this case, he says, I'm thankful that my Father in heaven is the Lord of heaven and earth. That means master. In other words, he can say to this cloud, or that storm, or this disease, or that angel, or devil, go here, and they'll go. And he's thankful for the fantastic revelation that God gives even to the weakest and most insignificant among us. Jesus says here, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and revealed them to babes. Now the word revealed means to uncover, to lay open, for all to see. And God has so much truth and knowledge and wisdom about himself, his plans, uh, about us and the world, about salvation and heaven and hell and victory and the power of the gospel and the power of God. He has all of this information. And Jesus says, I thank you that you reveal it to babes, to the least and most insignificant people among us. It's so true that the more... The more pride you have, the less God reveals to you. The more humility you have, the more he reveals to the humble. Jesus was thankful for his Father in heaven. He was thankful for the faultless, open line of communication between them. He was thankful that his Father was the Lord of heaven and earth. And he prayed and said, I'm so thankful for that fantastic revelation that God gives to even the weak and the insignificant. Now let's go back to Colossians chapter 1, where we find the Apostle Paul praying a prayer of thanksgiving for the Colossian believers. We've been in Colossians all this fall season. This is the fifth video that we've been able to assemble on Colossians chapter number one. The theme has been the Christ-centered life. And there's a lot of thankfulness in the New Testament letter of Colossians. So let me just show you here as an example. We were in verse number 12 a few moments ago, but in verse number three, it begins... We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. It begins with thanksgiving, and one of the things that Paul is so thankful here as the first chapter unfolds is the salvation of souls. He had heard from a pastor named Epaphras that the Colossians had heard about the gospel message, and they believed it with all their heart. And as a result, salvation came into their life. And as the pastor reveals this to Paul, Paul's heart leaps for joy. He rejoices and gives thanks for the salvation of souls. That's the thing that really touched the Apostle Paul and made him so thankful. He says, since we heard of your faith in Christ and your love for all the saints... Now, going to verse number 12, where we were a few moments ago, he's giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Now, there is that mouthful that we mentioned earlier. The word qualified means to make us fit. Uh, to make somebody in a state that they have the power or the equipment to do what is necessary, the adequate power to perform duties, Dr. Strong says. It's, it's an accounting term of, of somebody who has enough money to take care of whatever it is that, that they need, as opposed to somebody who doesn't have enough money. And the idea is that God 
took the Apostle Paul and Timothy and this pastor Epaphras and the Colossians themselves, as he's done for many other people, and with his strong hands, God made them, he equipped them, he gave to them enough so that they could be spiritually rich and spiritually capable, strong people. And he compares them now here to the saints. Did you hear that at the end of the verse? The inheritance of the saints in the light. So let's just think for a moment about the saints in the light. And there are many of them that have gone on before us. Church history and the scriptures are filled with names of the saints who have gone on to be with the Lord and now dwell in that glorious light. And Paul certainly is one of them, and we could speak about the Apostle Paul, and he, he's a great saint of the Lord. He, with the other disciples, turned the world upside down for the gospel, or maybe turned the world upside right with the gospel in Jesus. Others that we could mention are like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament book of Daniel, they wouldn't bow and they wouldn't bend to that great image of gold that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, they stood there while everybody else around them bowed down at the sound of the orchestra and the music. And the king threatened to throw them into the fiery furnace. And they said, we're not going to bow. We're not going to bend. I mean, these are saints of the Lord, and there are many others of them. The New Testament book of Hebrews the 11th chapter names saint after saint who have stood for the Lord and it doesn't even have enough space to mention them all because uh, Hebrews 11.32 says, And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead, raised to life again, others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection still others had trials of mockings and scourgings yes of the chains of imprisonment they were stoned they were sawn in two they were tempted were slain with the sword they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins being destitute afflicted tormented of whom the world was not worthy they wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and in dens of the earth and all these having obtained a good testimony through faith. Uh, saints of the Lord. Long lists of them. And Paul asks us in Colossians 1.12, consider the inheritance of the saints in life. Uh, in light, consider what has been given to them by God on account of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And one could only imagine the multitude of things and blessings that have come upon people like that for their faith and service to the Lord. I mean, we could list out a whole number of blessings. A forgiveness of sins, the power of the Holy Spirit, fellowship and, and worship and, and, and union with Almighty God, the, the privilege of being part of his kingdom or his glorious church, fruitfulness in ministry, love in their heart, the virtues of patience and gentleness, goodness and faith. And now they're in the light. They've gone to heaven. And so they have streets of gold, mansions to live in, and get to see the Lord Jesus and the throne of God and be in perfect peace forevermore. The inheritance of the saints in light. And why does Paul bring this up to us in the context of thanksgiving? He says in his prayer, I'm giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us 
to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life, in light. The strong hands of God had qualified, made fit, equipped, or shaped the Apostle Paul and Timothy and Epaphras and the Colossians so that they might stand right there in the same space and share in that same inheritance with all of the saints in light. I, I don't know how to make this more clear, except it came to me maybe a little poor child on Thanksgiving Day, standing outside of a nice home where a dear family is enjoying their Thanksgiving dinner inside. And the poor little child is out there cold and alone and hungry, their face pressed against the glass, watching all that's going on inside. You know, when I think of those saints and pastors that have gone on before me, some that have stood right here in this pulpit, and I heard about one of them just recently, and it, it just amazes me what they have done in their short life. And I say, I, I don't compare. There's no comparison. They're so far ahead of me. How could I ever enjoy the blessings of God in their life? How could I ever receive the same blessings? Paul tells us here in Colossians 1, verses 13 and 14, it goes on like this. You probably know them. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed or translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have received redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. There's the answer. It's through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You look at all these saints and you look at other Christians and you say, I, I don't compare. I'm so small and I've done so little. But you know what? It's not based on who you are or what you've done. It's based on who Christ is and what he's done. And Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. And through his blood, we have been made partakers. We, as poor and insignificant as we are, as filthy and, and unqualified as we were, he has qualified us. He has made us into a saint who fits right up there with all of the other saints. That's what Paul was thankful for on this Thanksgiving day. Our Lord Jesus, we saw, was thankful for his Father in heaven. He was thankful for that faultless, open line of communication between him and God. He was thankful for his Father who is Lord of heaven and earth. And Jesus was thankful in his prayers for the fantastic revelation God has for the weakest and most insignificant among us. And here in Colossians, verse 3, Paul was thankful for the salvation of souls. And in verse 12, he was thankful for the strong hands of God who can shape and mold the least among us into a saint able to sit with all of the other saints and share in their inheritance in the light of God forever. 2020 has been quite a year and a lot of people have suffered tremendously and still are suffering. I acknowledge I don't suffer the way that other people suffer, but I do tend to complain like other people. I tend to criticize and grumble. And that's easy to do. We all have the old man and we don't always yield to the Holy Spirit. And you might find yourself sometimes complaining about your children or your family or your spouse grumbling about your job or your church or your neighbors or more. 
And I fully understand. But here's what I always try to remember. God promised to meet my needs and not my wants. And my needs are very, very simple. I need salvation. I, I need some light and wisdom to walk in this world. I, I need the strength to get through each day. And I need a little bit of food, some shelter, and some clothing. And he's provided all of that and more in abundance and way beyond. But he hasn't give me, given me everything that I want. There's lots of things that I'd like to have, that I wish I had, or that I wish happened in my life. I try to remember that what I deserve, because I'm a sinner, is hell. And any day that I wake up, and by the grace of God, and through the blood of Christ, I don't get what I deserve. It's a good day. It's a good day when I'm, I'm not given what I deserve in life. I'm given the grace of God. And it makes us more thankful to realize we have what we need and far more than we deserve. And so we should be thankful. We've got a dear man in this local church, and he's got a great thankful heart. During this pandemic, especially early on, he took the names of every nurse that he knew. And he knew quite a few, and then others supplied names for him. And he made these signs, beautiful signs. And he posted them all over his front lawn. He has a large lawn. It slopes way up. And he posted these signs of the nurses' names all over his lawn. And he, he made a nurse's prayer. And he posted that out there as a way to tell everybody passing by. During this pandemic, he's thankful for all the nurses and what they've done. You know, if each of us think we can come up with a simple little way to make everybody aware of how thankful we are and it'll mean the world to them. Well, I'm going to pray and I give you a clear invitation that if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, it's the day of salvation. He died for you. He was buried and he rose again. And he'd come into your heart right now if you'd ask him, forgive you of your sins and give you a new life. And I'm going to pray and I'm going to give a little benediction. And I'm going to ask the Lord to help us all to be more thankful. Dear God, I am very thankful for the life that you've given to me and the eternal life that I have. Thank you for my family. Thank you for this local church. Thank you for my friends. But thank you most of all for Jesus and what he's done and who he is and what he's coming again to do. Help everybody to know how thankful we are. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's part of a poem by an unknown poet. In everything give thanks for all that God in mercy sends for health and children, home and friends, for comfort in the time of need, for every kindly word and deed, for happy talks and holy thoughts, for guidance in our daily walks. In everything give thanks. For the sweet sleep which comes with night, for the returning morning's light, for the bright sun that shines on high, for the stars glittering in the sky, for these and everything we see, O Lord, our hearts we lift to Thee. In everything, give thanks. Amen. Give thanks, give thanks, 
Give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good. The Lord is one, the Lord is great, and He is good. Give thanks, give thanks, give thanks unto the Lord and His love. It will endure forevermore, His love will endure. Give thanks.